Hello, everybody. This is Jennifer Schaus, and we're coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. And this is our monthly series. It's the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. So thanks for joining us. Uh, these webinars are the second Friday of each month. And each month we focus on a uh, specific theme or topic. Uh, we've got four subject matter experts with us today, uh, and they will take your live questions that you can type in on the right hand side um, of your screen, you'll have a little uh, chat box or question box. You can type those in. All questions are anonymous, so we're not going to read off your name. We're just going to read your question. Uh, and this usually runs until about 1.15 or 1.30 Eastern time. Uh, if you happen to jump off or you want to look at the slides later, the, the webinars are recorded. They're posted uh, on our website under the Q&A Cafe. Uh, and then the slides are always posted on the slideshare.net uh, website. So January, we covered cybersecurity and CMMC, which is obviously a hot topic. Uh, February, we dug into OTAs, which are uh, quadrupling in, uh, in use. Uh, March, we covered bid protests, and here we are already in April covering teaming agreements. You can see the other topics listed here uh, that are associated with each month. And you can sign up for those on our website, again, under the Q&A uh, Cafe tab. Uh, we want to thank the uh, Virginia PTAC, which is the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. They offer mentoring, training, uh, matchmaking, uh, a variety of classes for aspiring and burgeoning government contractors. Got some contact information there, as well as some helpful links. Uh, that will take you to their calendar full of classes and other uh, government contracting resources. Crown Castle is our corporate sponsor and they are one of the largest IT providers in North America. Uh, they provide services for government contractors. Your point of contact there is John Kipfer and his contact information is there on the right hand side of your screen. A little bit about us, our primary service is helping companies with GSA schedules. Uh, we also do assist with market analysis reports, proposal writing, pricing, and some of the other services that you see listed here on the screen. Uh, we also have a Wednesday webinar series that covers uh, the DFARS, which is the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplements, each Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Uh, these are provided, they're complimentary webinars that go through each part of the DFARS. Those are also recorded, posted on our YouTube channel, which now has over 450 complimentary government contracting webinars. Uh, again, the slides are also on the slideshare.net site. If you've missed any, you can go to the DFARS link there to listen, or if you want to sign up for something that's coming up, you can go to that link to get signed up as well. Our newsletter goes out every Monday at 11 a.m. Apologize for the background noise. It hits about 23,000 subscribers, primarily government contractors. If you want to advertise and reach government contractors, just shoot us an email uh, at the email address listed there. Some upcoming events um, with Carla Williams, we've got the GovCon Ready Spring Conference. That's May 5th. The Reston Chamber has their very large and successful B2G conference, um, teaching a class on GSA schedules, May 25th. And then we're doing an event uh, June 10th. These are all virtual, uh, a GSA in focus webinar with our friends over at FedMine. Okay, so now we're going to dig into today's topic, which is teaming agreements. Uh, we want to thank our speakers who have uh, shared their time and expertise, putting together PowerPoint slides, jumping on prep calls to make sure that uh, audio and video and everything else works here. Uh, first up is Carla Williams. Uh, she runs the GovCon Academy. As I mentioned, she has a great event coming up. Uh, on Cinco de Mayo, which I'll be participating in. So Carla, it's great to have you with us today. Uh, Jim Bender has been a longtime colleague and speaker in many of our other uh, webinar series programs. He runs uh, ZK Development Solutions. Jim, good to have you back as well. Tony Anakeep, also a very long time speaker in our webinar series. He's an attorney over at Williams Mullen. Uh, I believe you head up the, uh, you're the chair of the government contracts practice over there. So, Tony, always good to, to see your face. And Jeanetta Brewer, who's doing a double header for us this week. She spoke on Wednesday in the DFARS program uh, while on vacation and still on vacation. She's joining us today to, uh, to help us out with teaming agreements. So, 
Uh, I'm going to put myself on mute here and turn the floor over to our great speakers and just let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Okay, thanks, Jennifer, and welcome, everybody. Um, teaming is always a challenging proposition. And what I, I like to work with companies and have them think of it in a little bit of a different light. Um, a couple ways to approach this. A lot of times people approach teaming by saying, oh, here's an opportunity. I need to fill this gap that I have in my ability to fulfill the requirement. So let me go and find a teaming partner. Okay, and you know, no shortage of capable people out there that can provide support to help you close those types of gaps. So when these things go awry, it's not necessarily because both companies don't bring to the table what's needed, but it's because there oftentimes was not any proactive planning to make sure that you're forming more of an alliance as opposed to a one-off, okay? Now, this concept of alliance is really, you know, you're forming this, or this uh, structure, this partnership, whether it's formal or informal, um, because you have common interest, okay? So the difference being is the types of uh, teaming arrangements I advocate for whenever possible, they're strategic, they have a vision for the team, the team is pursuing something as a whole, okay? They're focused on a specific mission. They've figured out how they're going to capitalize on this alliance that they've formed by teaming up to either solve a particular problem, to leverage, their position on a particular um, GWAC or best in class IDIQ GSA schedule vehicle. Um, so they figured out who's going to be responsible for important activities like sales, who's going to do the marketing, what type of marketing are you going to do, um, who's in charge of capture, how are we going to decide which opportunities we're going to go after. So in order for this to work, you need to have defined roles with a specific purpose about how you're going to pursue uh, certain types of opportunities, and then when you succeed and win these opportunities, how's performance going to work? How are you going to handle problems that inevitably will come up because people have different ways of approaching things? So, and most importantly, I think, is people need to think about what happens when this alliance no longer serves both of us. Do we re-up? Do we add new partners to our alliance? Or do we agree to part? So what's the next step and how is that going to work? So what I advocate is just a little bit different of an alternative approach um, rather than the one-off teaming arrangements that I'm so often involved in and that I'm sure many of you um, of my fellow panelists have seen go awry for many different reasons, okay? So this is a more proactive approach. Next slide, please. So how do you get started forming an alliance that results in a team that works together in a holistic manner to both develop business, to win business, to grow your company, and to expand, okay? So here are some suggestions that I think people should think about if they're thinking about this type of alliance. It can be informal, it can be a joint venture, it can be a team. The structure that the alliance takes, is that's not my thing. I'm not an attorney. We've got two great attorneys here. They, that's the decision that they'll make. But when you're picking the members in this alliance, it's important to think about who's not a direct competitor that could benefit from what you have, okay? Are you complementary in your skills? Does it benefit you to be what some people refer to as competitors? Sometimes we're gonna compete, but for these specific types of opportunities, we're gonna go after it together because we offer a holistic solution to our clients, okay? Um, now, who is not a direct competitor that could make you a stronger contractor, okay? Because remember, why are we putting these teams together? Lots of different reasons. It could be that you need a socioeconomic status because that's the way your target agency prefers to buy. It could be that the government is bundled or combined or consolidated all these various requirements under a particular type of contract or task order, and in order to be able to perform your magic, your gift to the agency's mission, you need to be able to provide a whole solution, okay? But always keep in mind when you're doing this, how does this teaming arrangement, alliance, whatever you choose to call it, joint venture, how does it offer the government buyer a low risk solution, okay? Every time that you form an alliance, why is this gonna be the best solution for my customer and how can we convey that value 
so that they see us as a, val a valuable uh, contender to solve a particular problem or deliver a benefit. So as a team, are you gonna handle, you gonna deliver something at a lower cost? Is that your differentiator? Are you gonna solve a particular type of problem? Or are you gonna deliver something quicker, okay? Now, I think if you're gonna do this, maybe you should find one or two partners. Maybe it's specific to a particular requirement, specific to an agency, specific to a solution, okay? But, and then you guys need to decide as an alliance, how you're gonna invite other people onto the team. Because as we know, these teaming arrangements are very um, necessary for what we do in government contracting. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so what am I advocating here? I'm advocating that we don't have a teaming arrangement be thought about only when we're going after a specific requirement. I'm advocating that we do a market assessment and figure out uh, based on one of these criteria. So what would you, uh, what would make you a stronger competitor in the eyes of your government prospect? Who always beats you and why did they beat you? Can you use an alliance to satisfy that gap that you have that keeps you coming up as an also ran? Okay, how can you improve your proposals? Can somebody give you an in at an agency? Um, are, they have better pricing. Okay, do they have a better process for identifying opportunities? Um, who has an ongoing or growing need for the service or product or the package that you're putting together through this alliance? Okay, the only way this works on any level, whether you choose to form these strategic alliances that go the duration and that are not specific to a specific uh, to a particular RFP or agency, is if you do an honest assessment of what you bring to the team and what your alliance partner brings to the team. Figure out what's missing, okay? Oftentimes, as I said, people are looking for a size status. Maybe you need past performance in a specific agency. Maybe you have past performance, but you need more past performance that's larger and that's been more determinative and made more of an impact with your target market. And sometimes we team up to benefit from each other's relationships. Nothing wrong with that. So maybe you have relationships at DHS. Maybe your alliance partner has relationships at, at NIH or DOD. So what you have to find to make this strategy be effective is you have to decide, is it gonna be agency specific, specific to a particular contract vehicle, or is it specific to a holistic solution that you want to deliver and introduce to the GovCon market or any other number of reasons that are too numerous to list here? Um, so and when you're thinking about your teaming strategies, I encourage you to think about it from a holistic perspective instead of that one-off, because the vast majority of times when teaming agreements or teaming arrangements go wrong, it's because we didn't think through a lot of these, these items about who's going to be responsible for what, how our decision is going to be made, how long is the agreement going to work, and we don't really have a common purpose. So thanks, Jennifer. I think you're up, Jim. Yes, I am. Thank you, Carla. Thanks for that setup from the uh, 30,000 foot level on uh, uh, alliances and team teaming arrangements. And I'm going to get down and dirty a little bit. Um, I totally agree with Carla's philosophy that you have to enter into teaming arrangements, not when the RFP drops and they say, oh, these would be good people to bring on my team, but uh, building those relationships beforehand and making sure you have a bigger vision for why um, why you want to work together. But what I'm going to talk about is when you have decided with a team member that you're going to work together on a specific opportunity, what are the steps you want to take to make sure it goes well? Um, <clears throat> and uh, you may uh, come in and say, wow, these people complement what we need for this opportunity really well, and we would make a great team together where you're going to present a great solution, but I wanted to urge you at the outset before you sign on the dotted line to think about a few things, especially how are you and your partner going to split up the work of doing a proposal, uh, not just how you're going to split up the work scope and who's going to write what sections, but how are the two teams going to work together? How are they, 
what are you going to multiple points of contact? Are you all going to go through one point of contact? Um, uh, you need to verify to make sure that your partner, you know, when, you know, when we're dating and we're meeting somebody for the first time, we might have a check, uh, opportunity or an incentive to sort of, uh, make our paths look different from what it really is. Let me just put it that way. And when you're getting down to actually writing a proposal and putting resources on the line and your reputation online, you better make sure that what they said they did, they really did. Um, hammer down dates for that past performance, customers, contract numbers, double check them. Um, and verify that the people that they're putting in really have the qualifications, certifications, and clearances and availability to work on the contract before you go too far because, you know, your reputation's on the line. Next slide, please, Jennifer. <clears throat> So we're talking here about due diligence, trust but verify. Uh, yes, you really want this partnership to work, but in order for the partnership to work, you gotta make sure that you understand everything about your partner. It's important to the success of the venture. You wanna do your due diligence just to make sure that the company's financial strength is what it is. And even if, uh, even if, uh, uh, you're the one that's paying them. You want to make sure that, uh, you know, bad credit history is a sign of a poorly run company. And you want to make sure that if you're getting into a big deal with them, a good thing to do is to make sure they have a good credit history. Check their industry publication to see that they're an industry leader. What are they known for and what are they doing well and not doing so well? Check out their social media news outlets to see if they say who they say they are, if they're a respected spokesperson or expertise in the area that they say they are. Um, one thing that I really love to do is to immediately look up what their records are at FPDS to see how many contracts they have. Um, are they prime contracts or are they subcontracts? Are there certifications that they say they have and their set aside up to date? The SBA uh, Dynamic Small Business uh, database. Um, it, it has very good current information about whether they're still in the 8A program, whether th whether they are a hub zone, uh, what what they're small in and what they're not small in, whether they're woman owned. Um, you can also get an idea from the FPDS record or now beta.sam or usspending.gov. Um, who else is in the competitive landscape that they may not be telling about you about or they may not know about <clears throat> just so you know who you're dealing with and you may want to do some due diligence on them to make sure that the offering you're giving to the government is really um, an exceptional offering with differentiators. And e even just doing some Google can dig up stuff. It's hard to believe um, and you know, we should all be Googling ourselves once in a while to see what's out there in the public domain and trying to make sure um, make sure it's accurate. And, you know, apart from past performances and staff and certifications and vehicles, all of which are important, uh, you should understand what the culture of your partner is like and what they find valuable and how they work with other people. Not to say that they should have the same working culture as yours. But if, but if you have an assumption about punctuality and how you put something together, uh, creativity versus, um, versus compliance, uh, it's okay if your partner has a different perspective of that, but don't expect them to be just like you, which is why sometimes partnerships work, bet, work better the longer you are together. Uh, that uh, I've often found in a working relationship is sometimes you lose the first proposal you work on together, but that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the partnership. It just means you had to get some of the kinks out of working together, and the second time around, you do a lot better. Uh, next slide, please. Good thing to ask questions about now before you get into the heat of the proposal. Uh, writing is what's the management structure for the proposal? 
in terms of who supervises whom, um, who is expected to do what. Uh, big question always is, is whether you get to see the prime contractor's proposal if, it, if you're a sub. You don't have a right to it. They're the ones who are contracting with the government and they don't have to show you anything. However, you should push for getting a peek at that because you want to make sure that your sterling proposal isn't put next to a piece of crap, which makes you look bad and makes you wonder, well, why did I work so hard on this thing when they when they can't write a decent technical or they're not doing what they said they could do? Um, and you know, the way to get at that is to say we have a certain expertise and uh, we think that expertise could be very helpful in reviewing your sections of the proposal. And we are scrupulously going to fall, follow our non-disclosure agreement and not use this elsewhere um, and see how that goes. Uh, you want to make sure you know who the corporate sponsors are, who the proposal manager are, is, who the section leads are, who the pricing leads, all these people who are necessary to make a proposal run. And that the people at those levels are the corporate level are talking to whether the proposal management level. Um, and so you know who's in charge of doing everything so you can effectively communicate across the teams when you have questions or problems happen. Um, your prime contractor should be willing to give you very clear instructions about what they want in your section. It should not be just left up to, well, you know all about this, so you write it. Well, it's got to fit into the bigger vision of the proposal, and it's got to not duplicate with other sections of the proposal. Um, and the prime should really have a clear idea of how each section is going to work, even your sections. And um, don't wait until the first review, the pink team review, to sort all that out. It just gets to be a mess and extra work. Uh, push your prime, your prime to really figure that out, or you work with them to figure that out before people put fingers to keyboard. Um, obviously, there's stuff like uh, asking for the format of past performances and resumes so you don't waste a lot of time uh, after you've submitted in your format, putting it into their format. That just wastes everybody's time. Uh, make sure we have a clear idea who's responsible for each step in the process, and you know how to put together a proposal. Ask the question, who's going to be doing the formatting? How are we going to come up with that? Um, what artwork do you need from us? In, what's, in what format? Um, who's going to be responsible for the editing and the, the production and the submission? Um, problem resolution, we always, you know, we're dating somebody who always wants things to work out well, but sometimes they don't. Um, and that's just part of working with somebody else. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong, but it's good before the problem happens to have a process for when something goes wrong, uh, who, how do we sort these things out and how do we elevate it up the chain and resolve these things quickly? These usually come in the form of like data calls and, you know, how fast should we be responding to data calls from the prime? Uh, those sorts of things. And this last bullet point is one of the toughest ones, but it really is important that at the outset, you should not be writing your, your technical draft without having an idea of how much money you're going to get to do it. The prime contractor should know what the price to win level is. They should know what they're bidding overall and how much they're going to have and how much you're going to have. And they should be able to give you pretty clear guidelines on that. Um, don't settle for, well, why don't you just price it? We'll see how it turns out. No, 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 no. Because what is going to happen is you're going to bid too high because you have no guidance. And then you're going to have to go back and not only do you redo your budget, but redo your technical that aligns with the budget. And that's the big mess. Who wants to do that? Um, it's the prime's job to have figured this out, um, to have figured out uh, how the budget is structured and what everything is going to have to cost. Um, and if they're hesitant about doing this, offer to really uh, get into meetings and hash out um, how to price it ahead of time. And I believe that's my last slide. Thank you, uh, Jim. That and Carla, that was a, a great, uh, you know, business perspective on teaming agreements. Um, 
and thank you, Jennifer, for inviting us and setting this all up. Janetta Brewer and I are now going to uh, take on a look at the, the legal aspects of teaming agreements, uh, what they comprise. And first, let's sort of deal with the basics. Um, curiously, although almost everything in government contracts is defined, there is no definition for a teaming agreement. It's, it's merely an agreement that memorializes something else, which is a contractor teaming arrangement, which is the term that the FAR uses. And the FAR recognizes two types of contractor teaming agreements, a vertical one and a horizontal one. And today we're focusing and what everybody, what, what uh, Carl and Jim uh, were really talking about, for the most part, were vertical teaming agreements, which are a situation where two or more companies uh, agree to team up um, in a prime subcontractor relationship. And I'm gonna have to kill something on my computer here, apologies. Um, to uh, go after a single contract or, and kind of what Carla was talking about, a whole program where you might have a whole number of contracts you're gonna pursue, and they're gonna be off ramps off of your teaming agreement. Um, the FAR recognizes these types of, uh, of agreements. They, they also recognize the horizontal type. Horizontal type of teaming agreement is a joint venture or a partnership where parties really come together in some form of a business combination to serve as a prime contractor in submitting a proposal. That's the subject for a separate seminar, which, uh, Shane Fernandez and I gave a couple weeks ago and are on Jennifer's website. Um, that's where you get the SBA mentor protege involved and there are a number of other considerations. I, I would be remiss in not noting one other type of uh, teaming ar arrangement. Under the GSA schedule program, there is a GSA contractor teaming arrangement. Um, you can find that on gsa.gov if you go there and search for it. It's a nice opportunity for two different uh, companies that have schedules to combine their resources. You are in effect joint prime contractors uh, on the contract. Um, you set up one to sort of be the administrative contractor, but let me give you a simple example. Company A has on its schedule bolts and company B has nuts. And so the solution is they need a nut and bolt solution. The two companies would get together, create a GSA teaming arrangement, and they provide nuts and bolts to whatever agency needed it. Um, it's simple. The, the contract agreement itself is on the web and you can modify it. So with that kind of introduction, why team? Uh, you know, Carla gave all sorts of reasons. Jim got into more of the details, um, but it really depends. There are circumstances where you don't need to team. You know, if you have a clear cut situation, maybe you do a memorandum of understanding or a, a letter of intent, or you just create a subcontract and move forward. But if it's something more complex, it's probably worth considering. In broad terms, why one should consider teaming, you, you, the pros in favor of it all work around the concept of expansion. How can you expand who you are, what you offer, how you serve your contractor? How do you spread the risk? From a legal perspective, one of the, the, the reasons for entering it into is to try and lock your business partner into a deal, to play ball with you and move forward. On the other side, the cons are mostly all about loss. You're going to lose control. You have to depend on the other company to do what it's going to say it's going to do. Um, and you have to deal with the fact they might fail you. So those are the kinds of balancing that you, you go through. Um, but what's important is that um, teaming agreements take a little bit of effort. They cost money. Um, and if you're not going to put the time and effort into them, you suffer a real chance that they'll be worthless or they will get you into trouble. And so you need to see what is the true benefit that you're gonna try and get. Could we go to the next slide, please? So, you know, lots of folks come to us and have over the years and, and say, Tony, can you just send me your standard teaming agreement and we'll just, we'll just do it up. And um, 
there is no such thing as a standard teaming agreement, although in every teaming agreement, there are some terms that are common. Um, you know, you need to, to think through a teaming agreement. And that's what Carla and Jim were talking about. A teaming agreement is something that should come into place at the end of an entire process. It's after you've done your market research. It's after you've done your due diligence. It's after you've figured out what your goal is. If you don't have a goal, well, how do you know what a teaming agreement is gonna be? So every teaming agreement should reflect the unique circumstances in which they arise between two entities. You know, I said before, they might not be needed in a simple situation, but as the complexity increases, if you go from say a single one-off deal to a programmatic situation, or if you get lots of team members, there, there's an increasing value in putting together um, a teaming agreement. Now, um, so you look at your goal and all of that due diligence, something you need to put in mind is, do you wanna do a teaming agreement and why, considering the fact it may be unenforceable? And the fact is that in most states of the United States, teaming agreements are unenforceable. Um, it's not because you want them to be unenforceable, it's just the way they come into being. Um, they tend to be defined, and it, since we're in the DC metro area, DC, Maryland, and Virginia are all three jurisdictions that tend not to enforce teaming agreements, but they may enforce parts of teaming agreements. So the reason that you might do one of these teaming agreements is to create a roadmap, some organization in your life to divvy up the responsibilities of what two or more companies are gonna do as they march towards that holy grail of one or more subcontracts. And you recognize the possibility that you might get something to be enforceable, or if you work at it really hard, you might get an enforceable agreement where the only reason to have an enforceable agreement is if things go awry. So um, with that, let's turn to the next slide and, and look a little bit at the teaming agreement itself, the scope and terms. I said before that there is no such thing as a cookie cutter teaming agreement. There shouldn't be because every two companies or three companies to get together, you know, they come at it from different perspectives. A prime contractor wants a loose agreement often. It wants to be able to get out of the deal. It wants to be able to shed that subcontractor for whatever reason. Subcontractors often want to lock in the deal. However, the tables can get turned if a prime contractor really needs the technology or the widget or the services that a subcontractor offers. So at that point, you might get a prime contractor trying to lock in a subcontractor and the subcontractor looking at the fact that there are other prime contractors out there who might want some wiggle room in being able to submit multiple proposals. So if you just start with that little fact, there's a lot of tension in the teaming agreement process that needs to be addressed. So in applying all this um, and trying to uh, capture one's desires, you know, the, the problem is that they're insufficiently defined for a court to enforce them. That's the problem that encounters. And what you see in the court decisions is they're deemed to be agreements to agree. And an agreement to agree is not something that any court will enforce. But within an agreement to agree, there may be subcategories of terms that are enforceable. So how do you get there? And so if you're trying to get to something enforceable, you know, we've listed at the top there the different areas that are key to enforcement. And I always point out that the most underutilized part is the preamble, the whereas clauses or the recitals. People often overlook them. Um, and you can tell if someone's resisting your teaming agreement if they're objecting to your preamble clauses, because in your preamble, you can lay out in excruciating detail the basis for your agreement. And the important thing to dovetail with that is in the boilerplate clauses down at the bottom, people often put what's called a recitals clause. 
and they will excuse me a headings clause and they will say that the headings are there for convenience only and not intended to be a substantive part of the agreement we always encourage people to change that to the recitals and heading clause and say that the recitals are a substantive part of the agreement and are intended to be a substantive term of the agreement. That incorporates it into the agreement and provides you with a wealth of information. You know, the prime contractor got this contract and this subcontractor has unique talents. And it is the firm intent of both parties that the prime contractor will award a subcontract if it gets a subcontract. And it will extend the contract if the government extends the contract, things like that. Then there's things like duration. Um, you know, almost every teaming agreement says, well, if the prime contractor wins an award, we'll negotiate in good faith for 60 or 90 days. And well, if it doesn't work out too bad and the prime contractor walks and you're left with nothing. So how can you change that? You, you don't put that clause in there. You say that we will negotiate a subcontract. Um, it's rarely used. But some companies will enter into mediation if they can't get to an agreement. So how can you make it easier? Um, you want to tie in people. So the ideal teaming agreement, you'd attach the subcontract fully executed to your teaming agreement and say, this is the subcontract that we will award. It will cover scope of work and price. Now, that's often difficult. Um, on a one-off deal, it becomes really hard if you're in a programmatic environment, but you can lay the groundwork. You can do 80% of a subcontract. You can identify the scope of work that's going to be given. You can identify an objective means by defining the scope of work that a subcontractor will get if the prime wins the award. You can go through the solicitation and say sections 2, 5, 9, and 12 are going to go to the subcontractor or you're gonna get these many people, slots, or you're gonna get this percentage of the value of the prime contract. And then in terms of price, which is often the hardest, you can begin to agree on terms and possibly an objective way to agree to price the contract once the work is allocated. If you do that, you may be approaching the point where a court will say there is enough there that it can apply objective criteria to provide you with an enforceable um, agreement. But the, you know, the key is, can you get someone to do that? And then you want, how are you gonna deal with the remedies? So most clauses have a remedies clause and it allows you to sue and stuff like that. But people build in limitations of liability so that people who breach teaming agreements really have nothing. Um, so for the most part, you wanna think of it as a roadmap. Um, if you can put teeth in, it's possible. There are some creative people, um, and we have tried to do it, it's been resisted, to indicate that they're liquidated damages if you don't uh, come to an award of a subcontract. There are some people that have put language in that if there's a bad faith failure to come to an agreement, then the prime contractor is required to create a constructive trust and take the revenues out of the contract at one and pay some of them to the subcontractor. Mind you, that's a tough negotiation, um, but if you have enough leverage, anything's possible. So what are the other terms? Um, those are kind of the things that get into boilerplate and things like that. You know, you can, most of them are self-explanatory, but I point to a few, governing law. The governing law that you use is usually dictated by the more powerful of the teaming partners. So they'll pick whatever state it is. Um, you also might pick the state where the work's going to be performed. But if you can, if you pick Virginia, um, it happens to be one of the most restrictive states on teaming agreements and the hardest to get through. California is by far the most liberal. Um, it is even enforced an oral teaming agreement. Um, New York is somewhere in the middle, and most of the states around the countries uh, are uh, of the country um, come somewhere in between. The termination clause, we talked about it earlier. We don't want the 60 days and out clause. We want something beefier, um, and you try and get it. You may end up with that, but if you put some other 
meat around it, um, you know, that may help. Liability. Everyone puts limitations of liability in. There really isn't a lot of liability in a teaming agreement. You're basically putting together proposals. And so nobody's doing any work. You're spending your own money. Most, most companies have to pay their own share. But be careful about limiting liability. You might want to put in, you know, protect your IP. You might want to put in the right to get an injunction if someone's stealing your IP, things like that. I've mentioned the headings and recitals clause. It's, it's a term that a lot of people just overlook. Um, I think it's important. I know it's important because in the last teaming agreement, the other party took it back out because they said, no, 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 we're not going to agree to that because we don't want the preamble to be enforceable. So, you know, um, I want to sort of close out with specific examples. You know, there's the ideal. Tony and Jeanetta can talk all we want about the ideal of teaming agreements, but then you hit reality. The example is you've got a company that makes it's it's the nation's leading company in a certain cyber area. It's got the best product in the world. And it has been trying to get into the government and has gotten a pilot project, but then out comes the kind of big kahuna, the great contract that they want. There's a problem. It's being offered on a GWAC contract and they're not a member of the GWAC. So what do they do? Well, they go look at all the 15 companies or actually it's more, but they looked at 15 companies on the GWAC. They did due diligence. They did market research. They narrowed it down to five. They interviewed. They talked to us because we know some of the companies. and they probably picked the best one to be a teaming partner with. And then they started the negotiations. Well, big companies always have suggested teaming agreements and they're not exactly favorable to the subcontractor, but this company thought it had a lot of leverage. And so it pushed back really hard on the teaming agreement. It said, we demand a subcontract. We want to negotiate it before the bids are in. We want prices. We want this, we want that. Company wrote, big company wrote back and said, nope, we're going to do all that. We'll negotiate the subcontract. We're going to be nice to you, but we're not going to put it in writing. So forget about it. And the fact is it's played out pretty nicely. And they even sent a subcontract. They sent the wrong kind of subcontract. And then you bring in one more thing is the subcontract negotiator. You know, you have to deal with people. So sometimes the subcontractor negotiator is not as skilled as he or she might be, and is sometimes has a bit of a personality. So, you know, now we're in the middle of negotiating a subcontract on a teaming agreement to get an enforceable teaming agreement. And the prime contractor wants to flow down not the FAR clauses from the task order under the GWAC, it wants to flow down certain clauses from the GWAC itself to which we're not really a part of. So there's a lot of tension in how this is going to work out. The big company wants to get into the market space. The little company is desperate to get into the space. Um, so we're in a real pressure cooker. It's a real great example of applying all the things that Carla and Jim and I've been talking about, and Jeanette is gonna talk about in the minute of what do you do once you get a teaming agreement, the legal, legal aspects. Um, and we'll only note one more thing. What happens if you don't get a teaming agreement? So we have two examples. Companies was in discussions, they're going after an award. Um, the subcontractor spent $100,000 and uh, eight weeks really building up the equipment and ready to go and negotiating the subcontract. And the subcontract negotiations went on for four months. And all of a sudden the prime calls up and says, you know, we don't think this is going to work. Goodbye. And this guy is left sitting there thinking, what? And they call and say, what remedy do we have? We well, don't have a remedy. It's an unfortunate. So teaming agreements serve lots of values. There's a lot in play. Um, and with that, um, hopefully you'll negotiate a good teaming agreement. And Jeanette is going to take over and, and convince everybody how to make it a great success. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, so it, they've heard a lot of great information from all of you guys. Um, 
my focus is going to really be on the compliance side of the house. And once you have a teaming agreement, the real goal is the subcontract. I mean, that's where the gold is. Um, and so um, things to take into consideration as you're executing that subcontract and talking um, to some extent about the difference between when you're subcontracting, as subcontracting um, in the federal contract space versus in the commercial space. Um, so one, just from a comp overall compliance standpoint of everything that we've heard today, um, and a lot's been shared, if you only take two things away from everybody's presentation, it's this. It's important to be clear and upfront about the roles and responsibilities of the teaming partners involved. If, if there is clear understanding and agreement, that solves a multitude of issues. So don't be afraid to ask questions, seek guidance from legal or other um, experts in the field, and be a proactive player, whether you're in the prime or the subcontract role, in formulating a partnership that makes sense for everyone involved. Um, and the second piece is ensure that all of that agreement and conversation is documented in writing, because attorneys like myself and Tony, we cannot help you if there isn't some document that captures the um, terms and conditions of the agreement. So treat your team agreement with the same diligence that you treat every other contract, whether it's your home loan mortgage or um, other things like that, um, treat it with the same level of due diligence. Um, so here I've listed seven do's and don'ts um, to support compliance. Everybody's kind of mentioned that many of these agree at the outset of the scope of the work. Ensure that the agreement is expressed in clear and certain language. Um, one thing to note is do not cite that a failure to agree um, is grounds for termination of the teaming agreement. Instead, it should be considered a dispute and handled under an arbitration clause. So you want to leverage it as an opportunity to um, come to agreement, not as an opportunity to exit the agreement. Um, do include an arbitration clause. Um, to avoid confusion during the performance of a subcontract, do not incorporate by reference the teaming agreement into the subcontract. There are many instances where you have language in one that conflicts with the other and you don't want to create confusion within your subcontract. So treat it as, it, as its own standalone document or agreement and ensure that all of your terms and conditions and the intent is captured fully there. Um, do carefully consider what state law will apply um, as Tony mentioned early, and do include a provision that's similar to what's found in the FAR Changes Clause that says that um, the parties will continue performance pending the resolution of the matter. You don't want conflicts to create paral um, paralyzation. Um, so make sure that is covered as well. Um, next slide, please. So here, uh, Tony, I've stolen your process flow. Um, <laughs> I saw it and I said, it's beautiful. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, the goal throughout the entire process is to get to the point of a subcontract agreement. And so instilling Tony's um, process flow, once you have an executed team agreement, you entered um, a proposal into the government, prayerfully there's a win. And then the next step to that is executing the subcontract agreement. Um, different from the teaming agreement, a subcontract is um, spelled out and there's a definition in the FAR for it um, that I've captured here. I won't read it to you guys. Um, I think the slides will be shared later and so you can read that part afterwards. But there are certain um, things that I do want to call to your attention with respect to spe special considerations when subcontracts are entered into um, under contracts that are with the federal government compared to subcontracts that are entered into when you're in a commercial marketplace. Um, one thing is um, related to the applicable law and jurisdiction. Although the prime contract is a federal contract, these subcontracts are considered um, commercial in nature and therefore federal law does not apply in general. State law applies to those. So. Um, Similar to the importance of ensuring that the state um, law that is um, prescribed in the teaming agreement is an important consideration, you also want to make sure um, that you're taking that into consideration with the subcontract as well. Additionally, although it's a federal contract and you have the FAR system that kind of dictates and prescribes 
the requirements that are to be included in that FAR contract, um, the FAR is written to prescribe requirements for government contracting officers and to prime contractors um, through the clauses. Um, and the way that those requirements reach subcontractors is through those mandated slowdowns. Um, another thing that's different and unique is privity of contract. Um, the government's relationship is with the prime contractor, therefore um, only the prime contractor generally has access to the government contracting officer, the Court of Federal Claims, the Board of Contract Appeals with respect to claims, disputes, and protests. So as a subcontractor, you have to leverage through the prime in order to seek um, to um, file grievances when those exist. Um, in some instances, you can have informal access to the Small Business Administration if you're a small business subcontractor. Um, also, there are agency com competition advocates that you could also reach out to um, to potentially leverage their assistance, but generally speaking, um, it's privity between the government and the prime, and so um, generally subcontractors have to go through the primes for those types of grievances. Um, and also something unique in the federal space is in some instances the government has to consent to subcontractors um, and that sometimes is a reason for um, a subcontract not being executed after a successful teaming agreement. When that happens, um, there are not many remedies available to the subcontractor. Um, and so one way to avoid problems under this clause is one, to act early, ensure that there's complete understanding and agreement um, between both parties and also with the government um, contracting officer. Also get SBA involved if you're a small business subcontractor. Um, ensure that um, the guarantee work and, and finances and, and pricing is, is addressed and understood upfront and that it's also addressed in the proposal. Um, and then um, during any discussions or negotiations, um, have that as part of the conversation that's happening with the government so that you can see during the proposal for phase if that is a concern that the government has so that you can tailor and address that um, and prescribe some mitigation activities in the um, in the um, proposal that's provide the revised proposal that you provide. Next slide, please. Um, so here, um, once you have the subcontract in place or once you're negotiating the subcontract, these are things to take into consideration. The goal of the subcontract is to ensure that you have a subcontract that one, meets the terms and conditions that are contained within the prime contract, um, and two, to ensure that the subcontract protects the interests of both parties that involve, that are involved. Um, I actually just had a conversation today about a negotiation of a, of a subcontract and the sub, a potential subcontractor had tons of issues with most of the terms and conditions that were being proposed. And one of the things that I shared with them is the government, when they enter into a relationship with a subcontractor, the government expects that the subcontractor will meet all of the terms and conditions, whether it's performance related for the deliverables, but also from a compliance standpoint with many of the socioeconomic um, and government corporate business ethic compliance requirements that are contained therein. And the government expects that those requirements will be met, not just by the government personnel, but also by any subcontractor that the prime contractor enters into a relationship in order to help it meet the government's needs. So it's important to ensure both from the prime and the subcontractor perspective that the totality of the terms and conditions are designed to ensure that at the end of the day, the government is going to be happy with um, whatever has been contracted for within that, that prime agreement. So things to take into consideration, self-interested versus fair. There's been some conversation today around, you know, who's who's the more powerful of the two um, within their relationship. You know, generally speaking, the prime has the leverage or the biggest um, contractor has the leverage. 
Um, but you want to take into consideration that long-term relationship that Carla mentioned earlier. It's not about this one deal, but it's about what happens five years from now, 10 years from now when you're, um, so think about the totality of the relationship. Um, other things to think about work with a self-interested versus fair. Can the subcontractor be replaced at a reasonable cost? Can the subcontractor financially handle a, a loss? Um, many of the things that I've seen with um, major prime contractors when it comes to subcontractors, when the um, original deal was formed, it's generally based around the um, pricing strategy of the prime and doesn't adequately take into consideration um, the pricing strategy and the financial strength, honestly, of the subcontractor and whether or not based on how um, the pricing is structured, the impact that it's going to have on the business operations of the subcontractor long term. And what that in, and what ends up happening is you have a subcontractor who over the long term has compliance related issues or performance related issues and they're not able to successfully execute throughout the entire life cycle of the contract, which leaves the prime contractor trying to either find another uh, subcontractor or having performance related issues with the, with the government that negatively impacts its own either financial um, operations or impacts its, negatively impacts its past performance. So those are things that need to be considered up front so that you're not um, addressing or dealing with those compliance related issues on the back end. Um, another thing, you have the standard versus non-standard um, terms and conditions that you can include. Um, it's important to ensure, one, that the subcontract terms and conditions protect the business, but also um, that mandatory flow downs are included um, because it's required. That's another thing I shared with a subcontractor earlier today. You know, if we don't include mandatory flow downs, we're entering a situation where we're non-compliant with our prime contract with the federal government. Um, but also, the prime has a responsibility for ensuring that it's slowing down those um, contract clauses, even though it's not mandated and required by the government, but they're important and necessary for ensuring that the prime meets its performance and corporate compliance related requirements. So prime contractors need to think about what are all of the requirements that I have as a prime contractor, not just I'm supposed to provide the government a widget, but, you know, service contract reporting, for instance, um, like what reporting type requirements do I have? What auditing type requirements do I um, have? Am I subject to? And how do my relationships with my subcontractors help me to meet those bigger requirements? And to the extent that I need information, data, performance for the sub from the subcontractor, to meet those requirements, I need to ensure that those clauses are flowed down um, to those subcontractors. Um, uh, timing of the um, negotiation of the um, subcontract terms and conditions, I think everybody has said up front, start the process early when everybody likes each other, um, when everybody's excited about coming into the agreement, and don't start work until you have many of these agreements um, ironed out and in writing with fully executed and signed by both parties. Um, taking exception to terms and conditions, I, I don't think, especially with small subcontractors, that um, that's done enough. Generally, as I think it was Carlo who mentioned, people are excited. They want a seat at the table and they're willing to sell their souls to make it happen. Don't do that. Um, evaluate. It's important to make sure that the terms and conditions make sense to you that you're actually able to meet and deliver based on the terms and conditions that are included in the subcontract. Um, review to see, you know, is the language boilerplate? In many instances, when folks send over agreements to me for review, I can tell that all of it, all of it is boilerplate. So many of them are not following Tony's practice, which says, I don't have a standard to give you because every agreement is different and unique. There are a lot of boilerplate stuff out there when you actually say, well, what exactly are you planning to do? Like, what's the agreement with the government? And then you look at the cost and how does this help you to do that? And many folks can't answer the question because they just flowed some boilerplate language in the agreement that um, 
makes no sense when you actually think about the practicality of the work that's being done. So um, make sure to question that type of language. Um, and also make sure that you know and understand the FAR, the mandatory clauses, um, know it as well as your prime contractors so that you know if they're flowing it to you because they have to versus something that's being included in your language that isn't a mandatory thing. And only take exception to those things that you either know for, for a fact that you're not able to comply with um, or that in general will just seem unfair. From an internal controls and approval standpoint, um, this is another one that I, I see companies struggling with, um, especially when it comes to non-standard terms and conditions. Um, there are a lot of flaw, FAR clauses that are in contracts that place restrictions on the types of language that can be included in the company's agreements with its employees or the company's agreements with its subcontractors. And when during the negotiation of subcontracts, sometimes that non-standard language that's being negotiated creates conflict or compliance deficiencies with FAR clauses that say thou shalt not include, you know, this type of language in an agreement. So it's important to ensure that to the extent that non-standard language, and by non-standard I mean if, if there's a FAR clause that says this shall be prescribed or flowed down, that's standard language that's included. But if you want to tweak that language or make changes to that language, it becomes non-standard. And so when those types of negotiations are occurring, it's important as a company to have controls in place that says who can authorize changes to proposed clauses. My recommendation is that council be um, involved in that because council will have the background and understanding to know whether or not any of those changes are creating conflicts with other requirements that are contained within um, the contract. And also, similarly, from a record keeping and audit perspective, um, this also creates a lot of compliance related deficiencies for companies as well. So it's important when companies are coming together to negotiate, um, there's an understanding of who's responsible for recording our negotiations, where is that information contained. Um, my practice is to capture you know, a record of the negotiation in writing um, and share that amongst both parties afterwards. Um, it's important to know, you know, not just who's keeping the records, but where it's being kept and for how long it's being kept. It's important to have good records management processes in place. This is what helps to protect the company, one, during audits, but also it protects the companies. Um, God forbid there's a litigation involved. People leave companies all the time, especially these huge, you know, multi-billion dollar companies. People are in and out of the door all the time. Memories are just horrible and bad because people have a lot going on. And so having, you know, the records of agreements and conversations is important. Um, and that concludes my piece of it. Great. Thank you guys for a fantastic uh, presentation. There's obviously a lot to think about with uh, teaming agreements. The, there's obviously a, a cost of doing business and some due diligence to, con to conduct up front. Um, so now we're going to get into the questions. I know that uh, there was one or two that came in from the audience, but we're going to run through some of these real quick. And if you do have questions, please type them in on the right hand side. So Carla, over to you for this. Uh, how would you recommend I identify companies to explore this approach with? Maybe you're on mute. Let me make sure I didn't mute you yeah, by accident. That's... Okay, thank you. Okay. So how would you identify a company? Again, you've got to look at what your gap is. What is the outcome that you're hoping to achieve? Are you, is this a long-term arrangement? Is it agency specific? So. Depend, once you determine what the goal you have is for um, this alliance, it's kind of like when you're, you know, I have a 23 year old, so I'm going to use his analogy about dating during COVID, right? So, you know, when you're on the, the, the websites, you're, you know, you're dating, you're surveying a lot of people, you're looking at a lot of people to see what works, what doesn't work. It's going to be a similar approach here because you're looking right now when you're looking for a company, you're dating. 
the alliance is more like the engagement, hopefully ultimately a longer term thing going on. So the key is to figure out, do a broad survey of what's out there. If you're looking to penetrate a specific agency, you, there are tons of databases out there that will help you to identify the companies that are playing in your space that you need to form an alliance with at that particular agency. Likewise, if you are on a particular, uh, you, you find a, a client and they, uh, I think it was, I don't remember if it was Tony or Janetta that mentioned, but if you're on, I think it was Tony, um, where there's a GWAC and you don't have a seat at the GWAC, well, you're going to go and look at those companies that have the GWAC. And in that particular situation, I recommend you go with those companies that, you know, maybe have been only moderately successful. So you got to figure out what you're looking to get. You don't want somebody who doesn't have any success, but you want somebody that has just enough success that you bring something to the table. If you go with the most popular person at the dance or the most popular person at that agency, unless you are some offering some sort of a critical service, they don't need you, right? And if you talk to people at large businesses, they'll tell you that. If they talk to you honestly, they'll tell you that. What can you bring to me that I don't already have? So identifying a company to, uh, to explore an alliance with requires you to figure out what your goal is and how your goal complements your potential partners and what you bring to the table that they can't provide themselves. And Jim, over to you uh, for this one, which is, I'm a small company. How can we be sure a big company won't take advantage of us? Yeah, following up on what Carla said, um, you got to know you've got to know your value. Pe people are people. Uh, I'm an optimistic guy. I assume people are nice and are going to do things that are fair. Unfortunately, fair doesn't mean giving you everything you want. Um, I think you need to go into these things with your eyes open about what could happen. Um, some horror stories have been shared. I'm sure you've heard others about what can go wrong. And think about how you can leverage what you have to give to the arrangement in order to get written into your teaming agreement clauses and expectations that are going to mitigate that stuff. But it is going to be happen. It, it is going to happen that uh, big fish are going to take advantage of little fish uh, because that's how they became big fish. It doesn't mean that they're evil. It just means that they can. Um, and just be aware. Uh, make make sure that you aren't railroaded into stuff that you just don't have to accept. Um, and it helps to pay somebody like Tony or Janetta who understand all the rules and say no. We don't have to do this. You don't have to flow down all these clauses. No, we want more specific language on how we're going to do the work share and how we're going to guarantee the work share. Come on, we're reasonable people. Let's come to a reasonable agreement here. And make sure you do that before you've gotten too deep into it and given them too much that um, you don't have the leverage you had at the outset. So that's all I'd advise. And Tony, uh, to you for this one, if teaming agreements are unenforceable, why should I bother? So it, uh, like everything I've said, I, it's the true lawyer's answer. It depends. Um, and there are going to be circumstances where, you know, you may take a hard look at yourself and say, you know, we can do this internally. We don't need to team at the end of the day. We want to keep that internal growth potential ourselves. And we'll go hire somebody on the market to bring that skill set into our team. Or you might find that a letter of intent or a memorandum of understanding is going to be sufficient. But if you think it through, you know, at the end of the day, you're two companies that were at the campfire singing Kumbaya, and you're having a great time and you'd love to do business together. But um, if you're like my family and you don't plan it out, uh, we enter in a total cluster and nothing gets done and it gets delayed and it's not very efficient. So a teaming agreement, you know, if you think of it as just a roadmap, don't even call it a teaming agreement if you don't want to. It's just how are we going to work together? How are we going to do all the things that Carla and Janetta and Jim are talking about? How are we going to get to the win? 
that's what you're trying to do. And a teaming agreement memorializes it. So forget about it, that it's unenforceable because enforceability is only important if it falls apart. And so that's the only reason you want it. And the fact is enforceable teaming agreements are hard to come by. If you get all the way to an enforceable teaming agreement, you've gotten so far down the path, you're likely to succeed and you'll never need to use the enforceable teaming agreement. It's the people who are sloppy and don't do it, who run into issues, who are upset and want to sue and find out they don't have any basis to sue. So, you know, if you think of it that way, and if you use the holistic approach that both Carla and Jim mentioned in their talk about picking your teammates, you know, teaming agreements are, are great if they're done properly and for the right purpose. So I'm a proponent of them. Um, I caution people, I've talked people out of them, but they're a, a good thing, even if at the end of the day, they're not totally enforceable. Great, thank you. And Janetta, uh, when completing a teaming agreement, what are key considerations for primes and subcontractors? Yeah, so there's this balance between um, creating an enforceable agreement um, and maintaining flexibility, which is important. Um, obviously, everybody on this call knows things change from the time you initially enter into teaming conversations with a partner. Um, it could be well over a year before you actually have a, a contract. And between that time, you've got negotiations and discussions that have happened within the government. You've got changes to the scope that have happened as well. And so there's a need and desire to, um, especially from the prime perspective, to have some level of flexibility um, within the agreement um, to take into consideration what those changes might be. Someone who was initially considered a, a strong um, partner, by the time you get to the end of the process, you may have met someone that you think would be even better. Um, so from a prime perspective, maintaining that flexibility um, and uh, is critical and important. Also, uh, the subcontractor's commitment to participate and compliance related activities from a prime perspective um, is also important. Getting that um, agreement up front, understanding what the compliance related requirements are, generally speaking, especially the big crimes, they do a great job of knowing and understanding their performance related responsibilities with respect to that supplier service, but not the other stuff, the reporting type stuff, the other compliance and business ethics type stuff. Um, that they're also responsible for and how the subcontractors help to help them to meet those requirements. So understanding that and including those requirements up front and ensuring that especially new subcontractors know and understand those requirements up front will help the performance, long-term performance a great deal. Um, from a subcontractor standpoint, Getting the prime's commitment to be identified as a subcontractor partner in the proposal itself um, goes a long way to help ensure the enforceability of the agreement um, and also ensuring that um, those essential terms that Tony and I spoke about earlier today, ensuring that those terms are captured in the agreement that you're adequately protected um, is there. And then the commitment, obviously, on the, on the work share, getting that agreement up front and in writing. Um, also um, is important for the subcontractor. Great, thanks. And as we move to the second round of questions here, I'm gonna ask you guys for short answers so we can uh, try to wrap up by 1.30 and get to the audience questions. So Carla, uh, very briefly, uh, should these types of teams be limited to one overarching relationship or should a company have multiple arrangements? I don't think there's any one answer to this. I think it depends on what your goals are. So if you have a particular agency strategy, how many agencies can you really pursue at once? Only you know the answer to that. So maybe you might have one strategy to penetrate a specific agency. You may have another strategy to leverage your position on some sort of an IDIQ or, or GSA schedule. So I think that before you engage in anything, uh, any sort of a longer term teaming alliance, you really need to take a good hard look at what you hope to achieve with that alliance and then maybe plan it out in stages, try one that's working. Once you've learned from that one, then maybe it is appropriate to have a second one. Great. 
And uh, Jim, how do I find the best uh, teaming partner uh, for a bid? The best teaming partner for a bid is the incumbent. <laughs> so if if uh, the incumbent uh, needs what you have for a recompete, they are a great team to be on because, uh, you know, in, uh, government likes to stick with incumbents. The second best is somebody else who is in the agency that uh, is familiar to the buyer, um, but needs what you have. Uh, be very wary of people who approach you after the RFP is dropped about entering into a teaming arrangement to win, uh, because if they'd been doing their homework and they were in a good position to win this, they would have lined up their teams long ago. Over. Okay, <clears throat> great. Thank you guys for being brief. Uh, if as a small business, I team with a large business, will it jeopardize my status through affiliation? Tony? Yeah, thanks. Um, this is a bit of a trick question because as we all know, the SBA um, uses this concept of affiliation in a broad context. It takes a holistic look, but the short answer is a vertical teaming agreement probably will not affect your affiliation status because for most of them, it's an agreement to agree. It's unenforceable. Nothing's happened. Nobody's really committed to anything. That changes a bit. If in your teaming agreement, you change some of the terms and you find that in the teaming agreement, a, a big company is going to ingest cash into your company, um, going to provide resources, going to provide people, um, you then need to be a little bit careful. Are you starting to trigger the factors? Uh, if you look at a horizontal teaming agreement, a joint venture, that quite clearly is a potential affiliation. If you're in the mentor-protege program, it, there's an exemption for it. But even under the mentor-protege program, the SBA can find affiliation on other grounds. So you need to be careful. Um, the CTAs, the GSA CTA agreements, um, I have never seen anyone say that uh, that creates an affiliation problem. Um, but the fact is you are affiliating and so you probably should consider that. Great. And Janetta, uh, what are the benefits and risk of forming a joint venture under the All Small Mentor Protege Program? Uh, two of the main benefits is one related to the, the assistance that the uh, mentor can pro provide to the protege from a technical management, financial, um, and subcontracting perspective. Also, um, the joint venture is treated as a small business um, category of the type. And so it allows, obviously, those large vendors to be able to have access to uh, opportunities that have been set aside for different classes of small businesses. Um, the risk is that there are requirements and agreements that have to be met um, with, through SBA. And failure to provide the protege with the assistance that um, has been stipulated in the agreement can lead to one termination of the mentor protege agreement, but also termination of your contracts that you have under that agreement. Um, the mentor can be deemed as ineligible to um, serve as a mentor for a period of two years. Um, stop work orders can be issued. Also, suspension and debarment um, comes into play, and also Civil False Claims Act. Um, penalties can come into play as well because at the end of the day it is an agreement with the government with with terms and conditions um, that are contained therein. Great and so now we're going to go to the audience questions again if you have any questions please type them in on the right hand side we've got about uh, 15 minutes to get through these. Uh, this one came in Carla as you were speaking so I'm going to give you the first uh, response here. Question reads what is an example of low risk for the client you are referring to? I think maybe I'm talking. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So an example of a low risk would be what is the what, when I speak of low risk, I'm talking about a client that has a an end result that they need delivered that they're depending upon a contractor to help them deliver. Those risks usually come in three forms. So if I award to this uh this contract is going to save me money. How does this impact those other two? Is it schedule or is it performance? But low risk means, for example, in government, I think that one of the biggest low risk you always have to deal with if you're a small business and to some extent, if you're going into a new agency and if you're a midsize or a large business is that you're an unknown. As Jim said, right, what is the government like? 
the known, the incumbent, they're a sure thing. They may be guilty of having incumbentitis because, you know, we got this. We're here. Nobody else can possibly do what we do. The reality is they may be right because that's the way the government feels. So um, that's the biggest risk you have to counter. So what's the way to um, lessen that risk to have the government choose somebody else? is find someone else that they're comfortable with or that has such an outstanding reputation that you eliminate and you make your alliance a low risk option for them in addition to the lowest risk that from their perspective, which is that one, that one which you already know. Great, so. thank you. And the next question is regarding uh, flow downs. How does the Christian doctrine apply to subcontracting and flow down clauses? Um, you want me to do that one, Janetta? The, so the Christian doctrine um, uh, is a, a case that applied to the termination for convenience clause uh, in a prime contract. It was left out. And in the Christian doctrine or in the Christian case, the court ruled that there are certain clauses so important and so fundamental to the deal that even when the government leaves them out of the contract, they will be read in. That creates for a messy contract. And the Christian doctrine has been applied to various provisions in prime contracts. It is not clear. There's litigation. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So the Christian doctrine doesn't apply to subcontracts. It applies to prime contracts. The tricky thing is, if the Christian doctrine were to be applied in a lawsuit and said that a clause that was not in the prime contract is in the prime contract, and it's a mandatory flow down, what happens? Well, the fact is that you're not gonna find that out until long after the contract's been in performance and there's been a dispute. So the likelihood is it's never really gonna come to an issue. Um, the closest we've come to seeing that is occasionally a clause is not in the prime contract and it's a really important clause to the type of contract you're dealing with. Example, Buy America Act. We had a construction contract, but the prime contract had the Buy America Supplies Clause. And ultimately, we negotiated with the sub to put the Buy America Construction Clause in the subcontract, even though it wasn't in the prime contract. So that's how you might get around it. Great, and we still have a couple more questions to get through, so uh, here we go. Please discuss terms and conditions and teaming agreements uh, and the sub. Uh, what about uh, code of precedence? Or I'm sorry, what about order of precedence? Sorry, in my reading glasses. Um, I'm not quite sure what that question is asking, um, but order of precedence is something that's negotiated. Um, so the FAR has an order of precedence clause. Um, which is often there. So it decides usually the text of the agreement and then attachments and then some other stuff. So in a subcontract, you negotiate that and the order of precedence might be agreement first um, to include certain attachments like the FAR um, and then various uh, other provisions. If you don't have them there, um, the general terms of interpretation are specific, uh, is more powerful than general, and things like that. Great. And the next one is, I've always heard that teaming agreements end when the prime contract is awarded. Is this true? Um, Jeanette, you want to do that? Oh, I was just going to say, uh, only if the language in the teaming agreement says so. <laughs> So the, 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 so part of any agreement, you think of it in any legal term, part of any agreement is a period of performance. And so generally you should include language in the teaming agreement that stipulates that the teaming agreement ends upon execution of the subcontract. But there are also different other terms that could be included um, that will stipulate when the teaming agreement ends. Like if the prime doesn't win the, the, agree, the contract with the um, federal government. Um, so to answer the question, only if it's stipulated within the contract, but the contract should include all of the um, factors that would come into play that would dictate when that teaming agreement expires. Right. 
Could you add anything to that, Tony? Yeah, the one thing to add is to address Carla's situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of what Carla was saying is our programmatic teaming agreements, right. where you're kind of entering into, you know, you want to go after DHS and you want to go after their cybersecurity program. So you're contemplating multiple contracts that you still put that clause in there, but you basically say that the teaming agreement ceases as to the particular subcontract when it's awarded. And so it's kind of a waterfall or an off ramp off and the teaming agreement continues. But as Janetta says, it's gotta be in the teaming agreement or you may be stuck with the very thing you don't want, which is a teaming agreement that's live and a subcontract that's live. Great, and the next question is, what if teaming agreement if the teaming agreement partner does not deliver pricing, resumes, and write-ups, uh, what about altering the work share in the work share for the subcontractor? It seems to me in that instance, you don't have a functional teaming agreement because what, I mean, I'm sure there's legal remedies that the attorneys can speak to, but if you've got a teaming partner who's not delivering what you need to pursue work, then hopefully there's a legal remedy built in. And I, I, that's all I, that's my thought. Tony, Janetta, Jim. Well, and I would also add that uh, certainly you can renegotiate teaming agreements after they're signed, especially yeah. if the conditions under which the agreement was made change, including the inability of one of the partners to meet their side of the deal. Um, there, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but in terms of what you do when the, when the teaming partner is failing to perform, I'll leave that to the lawyers. Mm -hmm. And what are some termination clauses you would deem essential? One thing I urge uh, my small business friends to not accept is termination for convenience. That's a government thing. And just because the government forces contractors to accept the idea that, you know, I can wake up Monday morning and just dissolve your contract and you're done. Uh, you, you don't have to accept that. Um, and 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 don't don't accept the argument that just because it's in the FAR, you have to accept it. I'm glad that was brought up that the that you are when you sign a teaming agreement or a subcontract. You're not signing something with the government and it's not subject to the FAR, ex except in some circumstances. So don't don't accept the fact that you have to accept that. And I would just add to that the way that the prime protects itself, obviously, because you don't want to be left with subcontracts that aren't that you can't perform because you don't have a prime contract. But you ha you have the instances stipulated that if the prime contract either naturally expires or is terminated, then the subcontract also terminates with it. Um, and so that's how primes would protect themselves in that instance. But I agree with Jim, just general termination for convenience because I woke up and felt like it. No. <laughs> Great. And are there any issues having a teaming agreement between two companies, excuse me, <laughs> between two companies that are bidding as a team all the time for two to three years? Um, I'm not quite sure of that, what they're getting at in that question, but there used to be under the old mentor protege, the three and two uh, uh, limitation that a joint venture could only exist for three contracts initiated in two years. Um, with the modifications to the SBA rules in November, the two year limitation is gone. So a joint venture is now limited to three contracts. Um, and if you think about it, um, if you go beyond that, um, the protections that are afforded by the mentor protege start to dissolve and the SBA will start to look at you as affiliated. So that's the only issue I know on that. Otherwise, I mean, they're joint ventures that uh, have existed for years. Um, Boeing and uh, Lockheed, have been launching missiles into space for decades under a joint venture. Great. Uh, last question here. Is it better to have a subcontractor agreement or a teaming agreement? 
subcontractor agreement, Depends. I would say, because the teaming <laughs> agreement is a promise to something that may or may not happen, but I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but I'd rather have a subcontract. <laughs> I agree with you, Carla. That's where the money is. It's, 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 the money is tied to the subcontract, not the teaming agreement. <laughs> Yeah, the, team, the, the teaming agreement is the route to the subcontract. If you can That's get to right. a subcontract without a teaming agreement, all power to you. That's right. Okay. And is it a uh, general best practice to send all teaming agreements and subcontracting agreements to council before moving forward, or just the ones you may be leery of? I, I would say it depends, <laughs> to Tony's point, but. I'm thinking of the in coming out of a major defense contractor where there are 20 to 30,000 contracts in place, you would overwhelm their counsel's office if you sent every single subcontract to their legal office. So I would say only if there, if there are non-standard terms and conditions that are being proposed or if you're entering into an agreement in an area where you're not comfortable, it, it's new to you and you're, you just need the advice or consent of council, but I wouldn't say every single teaming agreement needs to go to council. And and this is why, as a, as a subcontractor, when you have problems with the teaming agreement language, they're resistant to change it because they just want you to accept everything in there because the lawyers are too busy yeah. to verify whatever changes you want. Great. Uh, and one last one here as we're at the 130 mark on a teaming agreement. If we are a sub and out of state, for example, a Texas based company, but the prime is insisting on state of Virginia as the choice of law uh, for settling all disputes, what would be a good compromise? Um, it's whatever you can negotiate, but given that situation, my money would be is you're going to end up in Virginia. But you can always you can always suggest Delaware and you can always suggest New York. New York is high on business, and so they're good. Delaware is often people for some reason think is a a skilled state in dealing with corporate disputes, but not necessarily government contracts. Um, but a court might look at excance at picking a state that has nothing to do with either of the parties. Okay. And if we have a quick one here, I'm new to federal contracts. Can a company sign more than one teaming agreement, meaning with two primes going for the same government solicitation? If the teaming agreements allow it. Yeah. Uh, one of the big, uh, one of the big, uh, uh, big, one of the most important parts of what goes in there is exclusivity. So exactly. if they want you to be exclusive on this, then you're done. Great. And thanks, everybody, for participating as attendees and all of our great speakers. If we did not get to your question, we apologize. You can certainly uh, contact uh, Tony, Jim, Jeanette, and Carla at the email address that you see there on your screen or call them uh, the phone number that's provided there. Uh, the slides will be sent out later this evening. At the latest, they'll get to you Monday. Um, and again, thanks, everybody. Next month, I think we're covering more specifics on subcontracting. And then again, every month, the second Friday, we have a new topic. You can find those all on our website. So thanks again, Tony, Janetta, Jim, Carla, great uh, content and great answers to these, uh, these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank you.